Bank robberies probably date back almost to the very day banks were set up to look after and invest a client's money. From early in the last millennium, right through until the late Victorian era, crimes that involved the theft of money from a person or from property were severely dealt with, to such an extent that in the late 1700s, a young boy of eight or nine years of age was hanged for stealing a postage stamp, once deemed legal tender. The message was very clear. The greed of gold has always been one of the common motives for committing crime, even murder. The gamble between having the funds to live a life of luxury on the profit of a bank's money and the loss of liberty was one many were prepared to take. And as we have seen in a number of previous episodes, some have gone to the extreme lengths to commit their crime. In episode 13, Abraham Goldenberg coldly shot dead the clerk in a remote bank near an army camp in Hampshire. And in episode 38, we saw how Victor Terry and his accomplice callously shot dead a bank guard during a robbery in Sussex. Today's episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record also concerns a bank robbery. And by sheer coincidence, like the cases of Goldenberg and Terry, the crime took place in a branch of Lloyd's Bank. On Sunday morning, February the 12th, 1928, the residents at Brian's boarding house at number two, Parker Terrace, Ferry Hill, a small pit village in the northeast of England, came down to breakfast. The lodgers were a mix of working men with a variety of jobs, miners, engineers, salesmen and market traders, all with one thing in common. Sunday was their day off. As a result, breakfast was served at a leisurely pace, with the men reading newspapers and discussing the mixed fortunes of the local football teams. As she served up the bacon and eggs, Margaret Bryan paused as she stood beside William Abbey, a 31-year-old lay preacher and bank clerk. Abbey had been staying at the house for the best part of a year and worked in the branch of Lloyd's Bank on Main Street, just a few minutes' walk away. She stopped and told him she had a terrible nightmare in which her lodger had been murdered. Looking at her with surprise, Abby replied, Well, that is odd. I also dreamt last night I was being murdered. My assailant tried to quiet me, but could not kill me. They got hold of my throat, and I felt a terrible sensation of choking. They came for me two or three times, but they could not get me. Then I woke up. We're having breakfast with a man that's risen from the dead, Mrs. Bryan's daughter Elizabeth laughed, as the other guests listened bemused and continued their breakfast. Anyway, Abby continued, murder in the bank is impossible. If anyone did come at me, I'd throw a paper right through the window. There's always such a crowd about that the crash of glass will bring them in and prevent any man from getting away. In view of what happened a few days later, it was to be a very ominous and sadly prophetic dream. The large brass paperweight crashed through the window and landed on the pavement. As passers-by on Main Street stopped to see what had caused the disturbance, a tall man exited the bank, turned up his raincoat and hurried down the street. It was a few minutes to three o'clock on the afternoon of Thursday the 16th of February, closing time at the Ferry Hill Black Bull branch of Lloyd's Bank. As the last of the day's custom was coming to an end, Manager William Abbey had been doing the usual cashing up before depositing the money into the safe. He was already preparing to lock up in time to catch the 340 bus to his home at nearby Spennymoor when the man entered the bank. Then, moments later, the front window was smashed and the man exited. Following the breaking glass, four men rushed into the bank with others in pursuit of the attacker who quickly disappeared. Abby was staggering behind the counter with blood streaming from a neck wound and someone attempted to make the stricken man comfortable trying vainly to stem the flow of blood. Local Bobby PC Philip Greaves was on his beat close to the bank when he became aware of the disturbance. He rushed to the scene and immediately took charge. Who did it? he asked. The tall man he's just left, Abby mumbled weakly. 
He was able to add that he had been robbed and had been battered several times about the head before being stabbed twice in the neck. Greaves could see that the main artery in Abby's neck had been severed and he was almost certainly going to die. He called for assistance and an ambulance was soon at the scene, but William Abbey died from his wounds before aid could be administered. Beside the body was a distinct cobbler's knife with a black handle stamped made in the USA, Southbridge, Massachusetts. Missing from the bank was found to be over £200. Police investigation found that the assailant had first struck him a heavy blow to the head with some blunt instrument. It was clear from the nature and extent of his wounds that Abby must have put up a good fight. The injuries showed that real violence must have been used and that his assailant, in his intent to plunder and rob, was described to have behaved like a ferocious wild beast. Inquiries soon turned up a number of interesting leads. Suspicions immediately centred on a chocolate brown Rover car with two heavy brass headlamps at the front. A waitress at a nearby cafe told detectives she had served a stranger that had come in around quarter to two and had left at 2.30. She said he was quite tall and carrying a raincoat over his arm. Another witness said he saw a tall man near the bank around the time of the attack. He was wearing an overcoat. Was this to cover blood spatters? Another witness told detectives they had seen a man climb into a hooded car with a two-seater dickey. A dickey being an outside seat that could be folded up when needed. The car had then left the scene at speed. Police locked down the North East. Roadblocks were set up in Durham, Northumberland and North Yorkshire. Brown Rover cars all across the north were stopped and the drivers questioned. Railway and bus stations were searched and ports to the continent also checked. This line of investigation soon came to nothing when a commercial traveller from Benwell came forward to say he'd been in Ferry Hill in his Brown Rover for much of Thursday. He had been in the cafe, had a cup of tea and had then gone to the bank. But he had left at 2.40. His story checked out and he was eliminated from inquiries. Soon a new witness came forward and her evidence was of far more value. Bus conductress Gladys Turner said that at 10 to 4 on Thursday, February the 16th, a man she knew by sight but not by name had boarded her bus at Metal Bridge. That bus had left Ferry Hill 10 minutes earlier. When the man spoke to her offering his fur, she jokingly replied, don't speak to me now, you were in Ferry Hill earlier and you didn't speak to me then. You are making a mistake, he replied, I have not been in Ferry Hill today. She thought this odd as she was absolutely certain it was him. Hearing about the bank robbery and the murder, she relayed these suspicions to detectives, saying that she would swear that the man had been at the Ferry Hill bus stop close to the bank at shortly before 2.30. She did not know the man's name, but he had been a passenger on her bus many times, and she knew he worked as a nursing assistant at Winterton County Asylum in Sedgefield. On Monday the 20th of February, the funeral of William Abbey took place. The horse-drawn hearse left Parker Terrace and travelled the short distance onto Main Street. The local paper noted an especially tragic moment when it paused for a short time opposite the bank where the crime was committed. Over 6,000 people, many from neighbouring villages, lined the streets and as a result the service was moved from the local Baptist church to the war memorial in the marketplace. Though some 500 walked behind the cortege, including Mr Abbey's 81-year-old mother from the Gilesgate area of Durham, along with his two brothers and two sisters. Pathetic figure amongst the procession was a Miss Bell, a fellow lay preacher to whom Abbey was engaged to marry. All across the town, houses had their blinds drawn and shops were closed as a mark of respect. As the hearse was leaving Parker Terrace on its final journey, Superintendent Foster, head of the local CID, and two of his senior officers were arriving in the village of Kellow, a couple of miles away. The man they were looking to interview was 22-year-old Norman Elliot. Elliot was a newly married man, having wed his heavily pregnant wife Elizabeth on January the 18th, just one month earlier. As they were unable to afford their own home, 
the couple were living apart, he at the hospital and his wife at the Turk's Head public house at Callow, where her mother, Edith Callan, was the licensee. Elliot's own mother had died when he was 13. This was said to have caused his father, a police constable, to shortly afterwards take his own life on a railway line. Elliot had then grown up in Spennymoor, where his grandfather had been the town's police inspector. Elliot was also an account holder and customer at Lloyds Bank, and inquiries found that before the murder he was having financial problems, but on the day after he had paid almost £20 in cash for some furniture and carpets. He was arrested as he waited for the delivery of some of that furniture at the house he planned to share with his new bride. Taken in for questioning, officers later searched his quarters at the hospital where, in his locked drawers, they found almost £150 in notes, some bloodstained. All told, Elliot was found to have over £145 on him. Elliot now admitted his part of the robbery, but claimed that he had an accomplice and it was this man who had killed William Abbey. Satisfied that they had their man, Norman Elliot was arrested and remanded in custody. After a further remand, he was committed for trial at the Durham Summer Assizes. Such was the public interest in the trial that a large queue formed outside the courtroom at 5 o'clock on the morning of Tuesday, June the 26th. Mr Justice McKinnon presided with the prosecution led by Mr G.B. Mortimer while Mr A. R. Lindsley appeared for the defence. Norman Elliot admitted his part of the robbery but claimed that he had an accomplice, a compulsive gambler named John Sinclair and it was he who had killed the bank clerk. Elliot, himself a heavy gambler who had thus far led an otherwise blameless life said he had arranged to meet Sinclair at the bank at closing time. He had met Sinclair at various race courses around the county and had agreed to accompany him to Ferriel on the day in question as he had some business to sort out. Elliot said he had arrived at the bank around closing time. He entered and saw a woman being served. He said he went outside and when he returned shortly afterwards he found the bank door closed but it was immediately opened by a bloodstained Sinclair who dragged him inside and thrust a quantity of money into his hand. This, he claimed, was how he had bloodstains found on some of the notes and on his clothing. As he finished giving his evidence, it was clear to the packed courtroom that Norman Elliot's story was most implausible. The prosecution insisted that Sinclair did not exist and that Elliot had acted alone. Several witnesses had identified Elliot and each case they had said he was alone. Nobody had seen a bloodstained second man anywhere near the bank that afternoon. Elliot also claimed that he knew Abby as both lived in Spennymoor and if had indeed been the attacker, Abby would have identified him instead of claiming the killer was a tall man. Summing up, Defence Counsel Lindley explained that it was a terrible predicament in which this unfortunate boy found himself. Innocent but alone in a robbed bank, covered in blood with a dying cashier and a pocket full of stained notes. Should he stay amid the incriminating evidence or flee? He fled. Lindsay explained that Elliot's post-murder spending spree on furniture was funded by a big win on the horses. He said that there had not been a single witness who could speak of any blow being struck or any struggle or who could directly associate the prisoner with the murder. The police had failed to connect the defendant with the Massachusetts cobbler's knife. They had failed to find the blunt weapon and they had failed to find the remainder of the money. They had also failed to find Sinclair. Prosecuting counsel G.B. Mortimer told the court that while it was true both men lived in the same town, they only had Elliot's word that the two had ever met before the 16th of February. None of Abby's friends or family were aware of any such friendship. And doubting the mystery accomplice, even the judge's final summing up ended with Mr. Justin McKinnon asking, was there anyone who has ever seen Sinclair in the flesh? After the jury debated their verdict for just one hour, Norman Elliot was found guilty and sentenced to death. There was no recommendation for mercy. As Mr Justice McKinnon donned the black cap, he asked if there was a reason why he shouldn't pass his death sentence. Yes, said Elliot. 
My Lord, I am quite agreed with the verdict of the jury in regard to your summing up, but I think you omitted evidence which we largely depended on. The fact that Mr. Abbey and I lived close together, that he knew me well and knew my name. This was very important. That is all, my Lord. As sentence of death was passed, Elliot swooned, and as realisation of his fate set in, he began to cry out for his long-dead mother. According to a local journalist who witnessed proceedings, following the sentencing, Elliot continued to cry, and as a slumping into the arms of the warders in the dock, was carried below like a log, his pitiful moan still audible to all in court. Many in the gallery, particularly women, were visibly affected by the pathetic scene. Awaiting execution, Elliot protested his innocence. An appeal on the grounds that the judge had failed to call the jury's attention to certain points of the evidence, which were strongly in Elliot's favour, was quickly dismissed. He became a father for the first time as he awaited the hangman, and once his appeal was rejected, he spent his last days on earth gazing in tears at the photograph of his wife, who visited him every day, and his son, who she had named Norman, in memory of the father, who he would never know. Sixteen days after his conviction, on Friday the 10th of August, less than six months after the murder, Norman Elliot was hanged in Durham Jail. On the stroke of eight o'clock, hangman Thomas Pierpoint and assistant Robert Wilson entered the condemned cell and within seconds led the prisoner onto the drop. The clock was still striking as the white cap was drawn over his eyes, the noose adjusted, the ankle straps placed in position and seeing all was in order, Pierpoint pushed the lever. The Ferry Hill Bank murder and the one four years earlier at Borden Camp bear many similarities. Both were single staff branches of Lloyds Bank. The two murders took place around closing time and in both cases the police were looking for a suspect seen driving a motor car close to the scene of the crime. And when both came to court the accused tried to pass the blame to a mystery accomplice. In both cases the evidence that convicted them was very strong. And of course, both men became dates in the diary of hangman Tom Pierpoint. Norman Elliot maintained his innocence to the end. Reviewing the case and deciding if a reprieve could be granted, the Home Secretary noted that the evidence against him was overwhelming and there had been no recommendation for mercy. Elliot had maintained that the two men were acquainted and although Abby claimed it was a tall man that committed the attack, as we see on the LPC4 form, Elliot's height was just five foot nine and a half, barely two inches above average height of the day. In court, the question was asked why, having summoned aid with the paperweight, had Abby not said it was Elliot that did it. Instead, with his dying breath, he was alleged to have said it was a tall man who did it, suggesting possibly he had not recognised his killer. But what if he had recognised him? I believe it's quite possible his last words weren't a tall man did it, but Norman did it. And that would show that justice in this case had been done. Thank you for watching and listening to this episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you don't already. Your support really is important to help the channel grow. Check out my website stevefielding.com for information on all my books and for links to the other videos in this series. Look out for Volume 3 of Tales from the Hangman's Record due very soon as both a paperback and Kindle download. Can I ask you to also check out my new podcast channel, Mostly Murder, which is available on all the usual platforms. Do you agree justice was done in this case and that Elliot deserved to be hanged? Use the comments below for your thoughts on this case and for suggestions for further episodes in this series. So, until the next time, thank you and goodbye.